Hello, church family. Welcome, welcome once again. Praise the Lord for another beautiful day. Good morning tomorrow for the audience that will be looking tomorrow. Um, yeah, I see people with sweaters now. It's beginning to get chill now. We're beginning to have clouds. It sounds like like little winter's coming in. Praise the Lord for that too. Uh, get rid of this hot, hot weather. Yeah, I'm just so thankful today, everybody. I, I continue to see new faces. Praise the Lord. Amen. So let's check out what Mimi and Moms and Billy are doing this, this evening slash morning. Check it out. Red light. Hi. Green light. Red light. Hi. Green light. Yay. Okay, okay, she got me fair and square that time. Yeah, it only took her five times. You are fast, Billy. Well, I don't have a lot of practice running away from Mimi when she's mad at me. Well, she has good reason. You took out her stuffed animals and put their heads inside the piano so just their bodies were hanging out. Not cool. I know. I'm sorry. I need to listen to Grandpa Joe and find better ways to play when I'm bored. You know, I wish I could say red light, green light to the whole world around me and that everyone and everything would have to listen. Yeah! Can you imagine? Report card, red light. <laughs> Extra dessert, green light. When Mimi makes fun of me dancing, red light. When you torture her stuffed animals, red light. <laughs> I'd love to be able to make people freeze. Kind of like having a remote control life. That would be crazy, huh, Mom? The only person I can think of who has that kind of power to control nature and everything else is Jesus. Jesus. Today at church, we are going to learn about how Jesus did something you would never expect during a storm. Did he start singing the baby shark song? No, silly. He actually walked on the water. I sure hope all the boys and girls stick around to hear more about Jesus' amazing power. I know I wish I had more power sometimes, and even though I can't make people do what I want them to, I'm so glad that I have a best friend who can do miracles. Hi, Hi boys and girls. We have a birthday to celebrate. Francis, did you turn three? Yay! Go, Go Francis. Francis. Go, Go Francis. It's your birthday. Go, Go Francis. I heard somebody got a phone. Noel, can I call you and send you emojis all the time now? That's so exciting to have a new responsibility. Baby Noemi came from North Carolina and she's back in LA doing new things like sitting up all by herself. Hooray! Hooray! Speaking of new things, baby Nisa has been getting some fun new hairstyles from mommy now that her hair is longer. I wish I had your cute ponytails, Nisa. Caleb and Junior have been cleaning out and watering an area in the yard to plant a mango tree, one that Francis Abuela is going to give him. That is so exciting. I don't know about you, Billy, but I am so encouraged when I hear about all that our friends are doing. Everyone is so creative and also they are helping their families and learning about God. Keep it up, everyone. Grandpa Joe prepared a special song just for us today. He says even though we can't force people to red light and green light things for us, that one thing we never have to stop doing is praising the name of the Lord.
Hey everybody, here in the backyard and at home. Um, it's good to be with you guys. It's good to be worshiping. It's great. Um, let me pray for us and then we'll, we'll get to it. Um, God, thank you so much for um, just just being back together, for, for worshiping together in person. And um, yeah, I just, I pray that you would continue to give us wisdom and on how to do this well and safely, but also that your spirit just would be with us here, would be with us at home, um, that you'd be shaping us through this time. Um, yeah, we, we, we give you now, we give you the words, we give you the breath um, in our lungs, and yeah, it's in your name, we pray. This one might be new to us. A lot of you guys probably already know it. It's called Broken Vessels. Um, the chorus is from Amazing Grace. So. All these pieces broken and scattered In mercy gathered, mended and whole Empty-handed but not forsaken I've been set free I've been set free Amazing grace How sweet the sound That saved a wretch like me Oh, I once was lost But now can see and I can see the love in your eyes laying yourself down raising up the broken to life Your treasure in jars of clay. So take this heart, Lord. I'll be your vessel, the world to see your life in me. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like. can see the love in your eyes laying yourself down raising up the broken to
You thought I was worth saving So you came and changed my life You thought I was worth keeping So you cleaned me up inside You thought I was to die for So you sacrificed your life So I could be free So I could be whole So I could tell everyone I know Hallelujah Glory to the God who changed my life Forever and ever Because I am free, because I am whole I will tell everyone I know you thought I was worth saving So you came and changed my life You thought I was worth keeping So you clean me up inside You thought I was to die for So you sacrificed your life So I could be free So I could be whole So I could tell everyone I know Change my life forever and ever, forever and ever. Because I am free, because I am whole, I will tell everyone I know. You thought I was worth saving So you came and changed my life You thought I was worth keeping So you cleaned me up inside You thought I was to die for So you sacrificed your life So I could be free I could be whole I could tell everyone I know. Amen. here moving in our midst we worship you we worship you you are here working in our midst yes you are we worship you we worship you come on and sing way maker way maker miracle worker promise keeper light in the darkness my god that is who you are way maker way maker miracle worker promise keeper light in the darkness my god that is who you are aquí estás aquí estás Tocando mi corazón, te adoraré, te adoraré. Aquí estás, tocando mi corazón, te adoraré, te adoraré. Siempre te amamos, milagroso, 
Abres caminos, cumples promesas, luz en tinieblas, mi Dios, así eres tú. Milagros, abres caminos, cumples promesas, luz en tinieblas, mi Dios, así eres tú. Oh, así eres tú, así eres tú, así eres tú, así eres tú, oh, así eres tú, así eres tú, así eres tú. Never stop working, never stop, never stop working. Even when I can see that you're moving, even when I can't feel that you're moving, you never stop, you never stop working, never stop, you never stop working. Even when I feel you are with me, even when I feel you are with me, you are always with me. Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Milagroso, abres caminos, cumples promesas, luz en tinieblas, mi Dios, así eres tú. Milagroso, milagroso, abres caminos, Cumples promesas, luz en tinieblas, mi Dios, así eres tú. Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Sing that one more time. Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, Light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Um, just want to give a quick shout out to the U.S. Census for providing the chip clips that are keeping the music <laughs> from blowing off the stand. <laughs> um, also, to the US Census for being a very important thing that you should fill out. I've been talking to a lot of people, and just do your census. <laughs> there is a lot of money and power at stake. Um, let's just, um, this, I this is one of those songs where it, it's just a song of worship. We say, what a beautiful name it is. What a powerful name it is. What a wonderful name it is. Um, let's just sit in, in the presence of God, knowing that we can, that we can draw near that this, this name we're saying, this, this name of Jesus um, is the name of a friend, is the name of a savior, is not a name in a book. <sighs> that he's working, that he's moving, that he has power over our lives and our hearts. Um. the word at the beginning, one with God, the Lord most high, you hid in glory in creation, now revealed in you are Christ, 
What a beautiful name it is. What a beautiful name it is. The name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a beautiful name it is. Nothing compares to this. What a beautiful name it is. The name of Jesus. Didn't want heaven without us. So Jesus, you brought heaven down. My sin was great, your love was greater. What could separate us now? Cuán hermoso su nombre es. Cuán hermoso su nombre es, el nombre de Jesús, mi rey. Cuán hermoso su nombre es, nada se iguala a él. Cuán hermoso su nombre es, el nombre de Cristo. Dejaste al cielo. Dejaste el cielo por salvarme Me viniste a rescatar Tu transgresión tú perdonaste Nada nos separará Maestroso su nombre es Maestroso su nombre es El nombre de Jesús, mire, maestro su nombre es, nada se igual a él, maestro su nombre es, el nombre de Cristo. Death could not hold you, they'll talk before you. You silence the boast of sin and grave. The heavens are roaring, the praise of your glory. For you are raised to life again. You have no right. Have no equal now and forever, God. You reign. Yours is the kingdom, yours is the glory, yours is the name above all names. La muerte venciste, el velo partiste, la tumba vacía. Ahora está, los cielos declaran, tu gloria proclama que resucitaste en maestad, inigualable, incomparable, hoy y por siempre reinarás, tuyo es el rey. Es la gloria, tuyo el poder y autoridad. Poderoso su nombre es, poderoso su nombre es, el nombre de Jesús mi rey. Poderoso su nombre es, nada se iguala. Sing what a beautiful name one more time. What a beautiful name it is. What a beautiful name it is. The name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a beautiful name it is. Nothing compares to this. 
What a beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus. Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are stilled, when striving. in life, no fear in death, this is the power of Christ in me, from life's first cry to final breath, Jesus commands my destiny, no power of hell, no scheme of man can ever plug me from his hand till he returns or calls me home here in the power of Christ I'll stand God um, we stand in your power we stand in your grace in that we are complete, we know this to be true. Um, please just please bless us now. Please just soften our hearts and just to hear what you'll, you you want to have, what you have to say, what you want to say. Um, we love you, Lord. It's in your name we pray. Amen. All right. Um, we're going to have our brother Wendell read some scripture via the internet. <laughs>
And the reading today is from the book of Mark, chapter 6, verses 45 through the end of the chapter. Mark, chapter 6, verses 45 through the end of the chapter. Immediately, Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to Bethesda while he dismissed the crowd. After leaving them, he went up on a mountainside to pray. Later that night, the boat was in the middle of the lake, and he was alone on land. He saw the disciples straining at the oars because the wind was against them. Shortly before dawn, he went out to them, walking on the lake. He was about to pass by them, but when they saw him walking on the lake, they thought he was a ghost. They cried out because they all saw him and were terrified. Immediately he spoke to them and said, Take courage, it is I. Don't be afraid. Then he climbed into the boat with them, and the wind died down. They were completely amazed for they had not understood about the loaves. Their hearts were hardened. When they had crossed over, they landed in Gennesaret and anchored there. As soon as they got out of the boat, people recognized Jesus. They ran throughout that whole region and carried the sick on mats to wherever they heard he was. And wherever he went, into villages, towns, or countryside. They placed the sick in the marketplaces. They begged him to let them touch even the edge of his cloak. And all who touched it were healed. Okay, welcome once again. It's good to be together. Man, that was just such a great time of worship, such a great time to, to come together and worship. I've missed being able to do that with the people of God so much. Um, the scripture that we read, um, we're continuing a, a series in Mark. And so um, last week we had a special guest, but the week before that you'll remember that we were looking at the passage where Jesus feeds the 5,000. And this, this story picks up right afterwards. And we're going to look at this story and, and look at especially how God shows up in our lives through trials. How God shows up in our lives through, through trials. We're going to see that God wants to meet us in the midst of trials. Let me just pray for us and, and then we'll get into it. Father, I thank you for, for your word. I thank you, Lord that it's food for us, and that, Lord, um, yeah, you, you help us to understand it, Lord, and um, I ask, Father, that as we, we open up your word together, Father, that your spirit would be ministering to us, you would help us to understand it, you'd help us to hear your voice, and help us to see you, Lord. Um, we ask these things in Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so this, this story picks up, like I said, after Jesus fed the 5,000. And so um, what we see happening is Jesus is dismissing the crowd. Um, Mark doesn't really tell us why he's dismissing the crowd. I think we get a picture of that in John, that um, in, in John's version of the story, they were trying, the crowd was trying to make Jesus king by force, it says. And so Jesus steps away. He, he says, you know, get into the boat. He compelled, the word there is he compelled his disciples to get into a boat and told them to cross to the other side. And this is late at night by now, if you could imagine. Um, we don't know exactly how late, but Jesus started in the afternoon, 
taught for a while, fed the 5,000 in the evening, and then it's getting late by this time, it says. And so um, late at night, the disciples take off across the lake. And this is, um, and it's interesting to think about what the disciples must have been thinking about at this point. They were probably pretty encouraged in their faith. They had come back from a little mission trip, and God had, God had worked through them. God had done miracles through them. They were encouraged about the things that they saw. And then they were with little nice noises around the yard. Um, and so they were with Jesus, and they saw him feed the 5,000. They saw Jesus do a miracle, and they got to participate in it. So their faith was probably encouraged at this point. They were also fishermen, so they, uh, many of them, so they knew how to handle a boat on the lake. But we don't know. It's quite possible that they, they already saw this storm that they were going to be facing or the wind that they were going to be facing, and they were like standing there saying, okay, Jesus said to go over there, um, but man, it looks pretty bad. Um, but Jesus was really clear with us, and he's compelling us. He's saying, he's saying get over there. And so they get into the boat, and they start to go. Jesus goes up and he prays. And, and what, we, what we know happens is that the disciples get out to the middle of the lake and the wind is against them. And so they're, they're rowing at this point because the wind is against them and they're not getting anywhere. We don't know how long they had, they had been there for, how long they'd been battling the wind, but they, they're rowing at it and they're not getting anywhere. It's not exactly like it was last time we saw the disciples on the lake. Um, where they felt like their lives were threatened. This is more like maybe they were frustrated. Um, they were trying to do what Jesus asked them to do, and they weren't able to get where he was telling them to go. And, um, and it's dark, and we're going to see that they get a little bit freaked out when they see Jesus. But most of us can relate to this. And one thing I want us to see before we even get into my main points, one thing I want, I want you to see in this is, when God tells us to do something, when God shows us to do something, it's not always going to be rosy, right? God tells his disciples really clearly, head to the other side of the lake, and they start going, and they can't even, they can't get to where he's asking them to go. Things are difficult. When God calls us to do something, sometimes we think, um, if God's really calling me to do this, it should be really simple. Things should go really smooth. But if you look at scripture, the majority of the time, things don't go very smooth when we do the things that God asks us to do. And we're going to see um, in a little bit, I think, why that is. Um, the disciples, you know, one of the things that I know goes through my mind, I don't know about you guys, but when God, when God calls me to do something, I often think about I'm focused on accomplishing what I think he wants me to do. I'm focused on, um, like, God wants me to do something for him, right? So I've got to accomplish it. Um, the disciples wanted to get to the other side of the lake. Um, I was just, you know, um, how, did, how did the disciples get to the, get to the other side, right? Um, all I would be focused on maybe at that point is, how can I get to this place that Jesus called me to? Jesus called me to do something really simple. Why can't I just do it? Why can't I get there? And they're rowing and they're rowing and they can't get there. And um, we're focused on what we, what we feel like God wants us to accomplish. And what I think we're going to see in trials, God brings trials to us for a reason. He told the disciples to go over to the other side and knew what, what they were going to see. He brings trials to us um, for, for a purpose that's very different than what we're usually focused on. And the first thing I want us to see is this. In trials, God wants to show himself to us. In trials, God wants to show himself to us. It wasn't as important that the disciples get to the other side of the lake as it was the journey. It wasn't as important that the other that the disciples get to where they were going. And if you read this story carefully, it's pretty funny because they don't end up in the city that Jesus sent them to at all. Um, they end up in Genesaret, which is in a completely different part of the lake. And so the wind kind of threw off their direction. 
And, and so often with the Lord, it's this way in our lives. The Lord says, go, I want you to do this. And what he wants for us is he, he wants something to happen in the middle of that time. We might never accomplish what, what he's asked us to do or where he's asked us to go. But what he wants is for us to experience him and be changed in the middle of it. And he, here's how we see this in this passage. God wants us to encounter him in trials, and he wants us to know him more. The key, the key to understanding this passage is, is verse 48. Verse 48 says, He saw the disciples straining at the oars. So Jesus had gone up on the mountainside. He'd come back. He's walking across the lake. He sees the disciples straining at the oars because the wind was against them. And so he goes out to them. He's walking on the lake. And then it says he was about to pass by them. He was about to pass by them. That might strike you strange. And sometimes when we're reading scripture, it's, it's these things that don't seem to fit or we don't seem to understand why they're there that end up being keys to understanding what's happening. But the reason why this is difficult for us to understand is because um, we don't know our Old Testament probably as well as some of the people that were, were hearing this. But when it says he was about to pass by them, it doesn't mean that Jesus intended to walk by them. We know that the disciples were freaked out. They thought he was a ghost. So the idea here is not that Jesus was intending to freak them out even more and just sort of slip by them and, and, and vanish into, into um, the mist somewhere. The idea of this is that Jesus, Jesus was about to pass by them in the sense used in the Old Testament. And what, what, where we see this word used in the Old Testament over and over again is when God is showing himself to people. We call it an epiphany. People spotted God. People saw God. And so um, there's, there's several different times where these words are used, but two of them are with Moses, um, and we'll, we'll get to that one in a second, and with Elijah. Um, the same words are used. And with Moses, um, I think it's particularly relevant because we see Mark making a bunch of references to Moses. I mentioned some of these last time in the feeding of the 5,000. What we have is Jesus is presenting himself. Jesus wanted the people to understand that he was the greater Moses. He was, he was the, the leader that Moses prophesied. Um, and so Moses fed people with the manna. Jesus fed 5,000 um, by multiplying bread. And he was declaring himself to be somebody when he did that. He wanted the people to understand that he was the very God that had come to live among them. Uh, Mark used the words, as I mentioned last time, sheep without a shepherd. They were like sheep without a shepherd. The same words that Moses had used when he said, put a leader over these people because they're like sheep without a shepherd. Jesus was the leader that Moses was prophesying. And then we see in this passage, it says that, that Jesus went up on a mountainside in the same way that Moses went up on a mountainside. Moses went up on a mountainside to pray and the people went out and got themselves into trouble. Jesus went up on a mountainside to pray and his disciples went out and got themselves into trouble. And so um, we're, we're, Mark wants us to see a, a correspondence with Moses. And if you go to chapters 33 and 34 in Exodus, we're not going to go there by right now. Uh, I'm not going to read from it, but if you want to read this on your own, chapters 34 and 35, we get to this really interesting place where Moses, God had already appeared to Moses. Um, many of you know this story of, of the burning bush, but God had appeared to Moses in a burning bush. But then Moses gets to this point where he says, God, if you want me to lead this people, you've got to show me who, who you are. And he has this dialogue with God. And then he asks God boldly. He says, he says God, I want to see your glory. And God says, okay, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to hide you in a cleft of a rock. And he tells Moses where to hide. And he says, I'm going to put my hand over you. Why? Because no one can really see God. If, if, if he were to see God, he would die. 
And so Moses says, I'm going to show you my glory. You're not really going to see me. But this is what we call an epiphany, an appearance of God. And Moses, Moses um, is in a cleft of a rock. God's hand is over him. And then it says, and then God says, I will pass by the same words. I will pass by. And what, we, what happens in the story in Exodus 34 is God passes by and he declares who he is. He declares his, his glory. And Moses sees it, hears it. And it's this appearance of God. Moses now understood, he saw, he had seen God. He, he understood who God was in a profound way. What God wanted for the disciples right here, this is so important. God wanted them to see him. Jesus wanted them to see him and know who he is. I don't know if you've ever felt this way before, but God, if you're really, if you're really there, would you just show me what you're like? Would you just show me who you are? Because it's hard for me to trust. And Moses said that. But the disciples here, God wanted to show them who he is. So it wasn't so much that the disciples were given a mission that they've got to get to the other side. Jesus didn't even seem to care that they, they wound up at another place. He wanted them to see him. He wanted them to, to know him more. And see, when we're in trials, we often look for changes in circumstances instead of looking for God. We want our circumstances to be changed. We want, we want to be relieved if we were in this place where the disciples were, we want, we want the wind to stop. We want to get to where we're supposed to be going. God, can't you show up and help me with this? If we're sick, we want God to take it away. We want to feel better. If we lost a job, we want, we want God to provide us one. But what we don't realize is that in trials, even though we want to get out of the situation, God wants to do something much bigger in our lives. Much bigger. God wants to grow our faith. He wants to help us see his presence with us. He wants us to meet with him. He wants us to know him. When, when Paul talks once about a trial where he was, he was despairing, it says he was despairing of his life. I don't know what kind of trials y'all have walked through before, how bad it's gotten, but that's, that's the worst that I think Paul describes in, in 2 Corinthians 1. I think that's the worst um, Paul describes of a trial that he's walked through. And he says, we were despairing even of our lives. But then he says, but God allowed this so that we wouldn't rely on ourselves, but on him who raises the dead. He saw something afterwards. He said, you know, all I wanted to do, he's human. He, he was probably like, like you and me crying out to God, just God, just get me out of this. Just get me out of this. But he realizes looking back that God allowed this to happen so I would learn not to rely on myself, but on him. There's something bigger that God wants to do through, through trials that we walk through. He wants to show himself to us. He wants to help us to trust him and rely on him. And I've said this before, but trials um, are called tests in the, in the New Testament. What are they testing? What was God testing in his disciples? He wasn't testing whether they could get to the other side. He wasn't testing whether they could get to Bethsaida because they didn't make it there. What was he testing? And what I think he's, he's testing in all of our trials is, are we going to love him, desire him, and trust him more than comfort or stuff? Are we going to love him, desire him, and trust him more than comfort or stuff. And so when we, we lose someone in our lives, 
it's not it's 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 not because God's being cruel and taking someone from us and we might not understand why why God takes people in our lives and we've this has been a hard season for so many people but among among other things that might be going on when God takes someone from us is he wants us to realize that we still we still have him and when we have him we have everything when God takes away our job and we realize still in the midst of this that he's a, he's a good father and he provides for us it's so much richer God wants us to love him and desire him and trust him more than comfort and stuff. Okay, so in addition to God, God wants us, he wants to show up in our lives. He wants us to see him when we walk through trials. But I want us to see something else. In trials, we also must beware the influence of hardness of heart that keeps us from seeing God. We must beware the influence of hardness of heart. How do we walk through trials well? And what we see in, in verses 51 and 52, Mark gives us this little commentary, this little, this little quick commentary that almost seems out of place also. And by the way, these two things that I think are keys to understanding what Mark wants us to see only show up in his gospel. Uh, there, there's two other accounts of this, and it doesn't. these words don't show up. But in verses 51 and 52, it says, this is after Jesus comes on the boat, the waves calm, the, uh, the winds calm, and the disciples are no longer freaked out. And it says, they were completely amazed, for they had not understood about the loaves. And then it says, their hearts were hardened. We're going to get to, to what's going on there. But what we see, it's, this is a crazy scene. The, the winds are picking up. I don't know. Um, this is a crazy scene here. The disciples, one, one thing that made me laugh when I saw this is, is that the disciples were not, they weren't freaked out. They weren't scared. It doesn't say they were frightened. It says they were straining at the oars, so they were working really hard trying to do what God had asked them to do. But then it says, they were freaked out. They were frightened as soon as they saw Jesus. As soon as they saw Jesus, they were frightened. Why? Because they thought he was a ghost. This guy's walking on the water, and we can understand why they thought he was a ghost. But then finally, Jesus walks onto the boat. They realize it's Jesus. He says, it is I. Take courage. Don't be afraid. And all of a sudden, everything calms down. It's like when Jesus speaks, their hearts calm down, and so does so does the wind. And then, then this, this commentary comes from Mark. They were completely amazed, for they had not understood about the loaves. Their hearts were hardened. And one question you might ask when you see that is, well, why does he say, they were, it says they were completely amazed. Shouldn't we be amazed at what God does? Why does he say right afterwards their hearts were hardened? And I think what Mark's getting at here is not so much that they were amazed at what God had, had done, but like the other time when they were on the sea and God calmed it down, at that time they were amazed and partly frightened, um, but they asked each other, who is this? Who is this that calms the waves? They were confused. Confused still about who Jesus was. Confused still about what was going on. And so hardness of heart causes us to be confused by God's work instead of understanding his glory. Causes us to be confused by God's work instead of understanding his glory. They were asking each other, who is this? They were amazed at what had happened. They were relieved that Jesus had, had come onto the boat and things had calmed down, but they still didn't get and understand who he was. And it's real interesting because Mark's giving us this experience as hearers 
and readers of, of his, his word, um, where we understand who Jesus is. And we look at this, right? And we say, come on, you guys. He, he just fed 5,000. And then he's walking on the lake. And you guys don't realize that he's God? You don't realize who he is? What are you so freaked out about? Or why are you so slow to understand this? And yet it's so much easier for us when we're on the outside to understand who God is and the implications of who he is than it is when we're in the middle of the trial, right? And Mark's giving us this experience of looking on from the outside. The second thing I want us to see about hardness of heart. Hardness of heart keeps us from having our eyes open to see and trust who God is. Hardness of heart keeps us from having our eyes open to see and trust who God is through the things that he does in our lives. Look at what this says again in verse 52. It says, For they had not understood about the loaves. Their hearts were hardened. Mark is making a, an implication here. They, they were amazed and kind of confused about what was going on with Jesus walking on the lake. And Mark says, it's because they didn't understand what happened with the loaves. What, what's he talking about there? What he's saying is, they should have seen this. They knew a miracle happened. There was no doubt in their minds that a miracle happened. But what they didn't do is make an inference that this miracle means that this, this person, Jesus in front of us, is the very God come to earth. They didn't understand that. And so Mark tells us they had not understood about the lo loaves. They had not understood what that means. They had not understood what it means for their lives. If they had, they would have reacted differently. They would have seen their trial differently. They would have seen what, what Jesus was doing differently. We might cry to God for a miracle. I don't know if this has happened to you in your life before. We might cry out to God and say, God, God, heal me from this or heal this person. And he does. And he clearly has, has done a miracle. But then so quickly we forget it. So quickly we forget what that means for us. Scripture tells us another story where ten lepers were healed and only one of them comes back and thanks Jesus. What were the other ones thinking? We rationalize sometimes and think, well, yeah, I mean, I think that was God, but I don't know. I think God probably helped me, but it could have been a lot of things. And we start doubting very quickly. The disciples didn't take what they saw and understand who Jesus was from it. The third thing I want us to see, and I'm, I'm going through these pretty quickly, but I want us to recognize some of the ways that our hearts get hard and we, we miss seeing God in the midst of trials. But notice this one. Hardness of heart keeps us from recognizing God's coming to us. Hardness of heart keeps us from recognizing God's coming to us. The disciples didn't get frightened until Jesus showed up. They didn't recognize him. He looked like a ghost to them. God was wanting, Jesus was wanting to pass by. Jesus was wanting to show them his glory. Jesus was wanting for them to see how awesome and great he is. Do you realize that in the midst of a trial, Jesus wants to show himself to you. He wants to show how loving he is. He wants to show how much he loves you. He wants to show how powerful it, he is. He wants to show who he is in all his, his glory and splendor. He wanted to show that to the disciples, but they missed some of it. They didn't recognize him. Jesus came to them in a form that they weren't expecting. Listen. When we go through trials, how often do we, we, we cry out to God and we say, God, meet me. God, help me. But we have in our minds the way that we want God to help us. We have in our minds the way that we want him to show up. The disciples probably 
may, maybe they cried out to God. They certainly wanted some help. They were stuck and not going anywhere. But God showed up in a way that they weren't expecting, a way that they probably didn't appreciate very much. What we see over and over again in Scripture and what you're going to see in your life is we cry out to God in the midst of trials. God shows up in his own way. God shows up in his own way. And we often miss God's coming to us because we're not open to the way that we want him to, the way that he might show up. And let me tell you something, something I've seen over and over again. God, God shows up to us through people. So often God shows up to us through people. And so often we, we, we've got our minds set, our minds made up on who, who we're going to relate to, who we're not. We're crying out to God for help. You ever gone through this before? We're crying out to God for help. We're miserable. Our life, uh, stuff is just messed up on the inside. And then someone comes and knocks on the door and they're like, hey man, I just, I just felt like coming over and checking in on you. How, how are you doing? And we're like, you know, I'm doing so well. I'm, things are just, just great. God's so good, isn't he? How often have we done stuff like that? God sends someone to us, and we, and, we, and we close the door on them. Why? Because we're scared. I don't want to open myself up. I don't want this person to see this. God, God is not going to be tamed by us. He's not going to show up in the ways that we want him to, but he wants to show himself to us. When we cry out, when you ask, when you say, God, God, meet me, God, help me, you might want him just to relieve whatever's going on. He wants to show himself to you. He wants to do so much more than that. But we've got to be open to how he wants to show up in our lives. He's going to do it in his way with his wisdom. Our hardness of heart, one thing that we see in Scripture is that our hardness of heart keeps us from hearing God's word and, and understanding. Um, you can look at Matthew 13, 15. And there's a similar passage in Mark. But it says, For this people's heart has become calloused, hard. They hardly hear with their ears, and they have closed their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and turn, and I would heal them. And see, one of the things that happens when our hearts get hard is we, we, can't, we can't hear and understand God's word. We've closed our hearts off. One of the things that I've seen, I've seen with folks uh, and I think we've got we've to watch ourselves. When things start getting hard for us, we have patterns. We have things that we do. Some of us isolate. Some of us stay away from people. Some of us, some of us you know, we, we maybe do the opposite thing. We've, we've got to be around people all the time. But one thing I see is that we rationalize ourselves getting out of God's word. We rationalize ourselves, yeah, not coming to church. We rationalize ourselves not, not sitting and reading God's word, not listening to it. Not softening our hearts before him. When our hearts are callous, we can't hear and understand. And the last thing, the, the last symptom I would say of a, a hard heart that um, we see in these epiphanies in scripture is hardness of heart keeps us from humbling ourselves and being repentant before God. If you look back in, in the Old Testament, I mentioned all these times that God shows up and people have sightings of God. You know what happens when people see God? Man, they're broken. Like look at Isaiah 6. Isaiah falls and he says, man, I am, I am a sinful man. And I, I live among a people of unclean lips. He's, when you see God, man, you're just, you're just broken. You're so aware of your own sin and sinfulness. 
when we don't want to go there, when we don't want to look at how messed up we are, we harden our hearts. We're not going to let God show himself to us, and we're not going to let God show how, how messed up we are. We just want to keep trying harder. And you know, the, the disciples were, were just trying harder to row and to row and to row. I'm just going to tell you one, one quick example before we go to the last section. But in my life, um, I, I try to tough things out when I'm in the midst of a trial. And I, I learned a lesson that, was, that has become so powerful for me in dealing with anxiety I, I tend to have um, a bit of anxiety and, at, at different times and deal with that. But I was reading a book by a woman, a, a Quaker woman named Han Hannah Whitehall Smith, and she spoke to something that I was just going through at that, at that moment. Because what I would do is um, I, would, I would go through anxieties and I would say, okay, God, I'm going to do what your scripture says in Philippians 4, 6, and 7. It says, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. So, Lord, I'm getting on my knees. I, I go through this period of thanking God and praying and asking God to do this and that, and I surrender myself. And then, and then I walk into my day, and then it doesn't take but maybe a half hour before I'm overcome with anxiety again. And I, I just say, man, I... I must have done something wrong. And I'm defeated the rest of the day. And Hannah Whitehall Smith was, was talking about this, and she, she, said, she said, you know, we go through these cycles where we think, we, we, we think we've got to do things on our own. And with, with anxiety, we surrender ourselves, and then we feel like God might, must not have accepted us or we must not have done something right because we're filled with anxiety a little while later. But, she's, but she said, but that's not, that's not what the Scripture says. God, God gives us, God puts us in these places so that we'll continue to depend on him. So every time your anxiety comes up, go right back. Pray again. And I can't tell you um, how much this, this changed me at a period of my life. Because it gave me victory in a place where I was having defeat. Because I, I started every half hour that this anxiety came up, I started giving it to God in prayer. And he started meeting me in the midst of it. And I realized he didn't want me to walk through this and be strong enough to row. He didn't want me to be strong enough to make it. He wanted me to see his power working in me in my weakness. And I kept coming to him weak, and he showed himself to me. Don't let your heart become hard. Our, a hard heart says, I've got to do it myself. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make this. I'm going to do this for God. God wants to meet us in the midst of our pain, in the midst of our struggle, in the midst of our weakness. So those are some, some influences of hard-heartedness in our lives that we've got to watch out for as we walk through trials. This last part, we're gonna, I'm going to make one more point and we're going to go into communion. But I want us to see something. I don't want you to walk away feeling, um, feeling like, man, I'm... I'm that, I'm that person. I deal with all those hard-hearted areas. I don't know if I can be open to God or see God. I want you to see this. We've got to recognize that also God in trials, God is merciful, patient, and gentle, even with our hardness of heart. All those things, that commentary that, um, that it tells Moses, or sorry, that that this commentary that Mark shows us about hard-heartedness of the disciples, their inability to recognize Jesus, even still, Jesus gets on the boat with them. He wanted to pass by. He wanted to show them his glory. He saw that the disciples freaked out. And instead, Jesus gets on the boat and he says, take courage. It is I, don't be afraid. And by the way, that word, it is I, is the same word, um, it's I am. It's Jesus, again, declaring who he is. It's the same word that it says in John when, when, the, when the betrayers came to get Jesus and they said, where is this guy, Jesus of Nazareth? And he said, I am, and they all fell back on the ground. And Jesus, Jesus walks onto the boat and he says, I am. 
and they calmed. But I want you to see his mercy. Jesus was meeting the disciples in their weakness. It took them a long time. He was showing himself to them. He showed himself to them in the feeding of the 5,000. He showed himself to them in walking on water. And he's going to continue to show himself to them. It's okay if they didn't get it the first few times. Jesus is going to keep showing himself. I think all of us can identify with at least some of these areas of hardness of heart in our lives, things that keep us from recognizing God, especially when we're in the midst of our trials. But I want you to know and I want you to see that God, God sees your weaknesses and he, he's persistent. He's going to keep showing up. He's going to come gently to you and say, look, I want to show myself. Open your heart to me. And as we come to communion that's, that's really what I want us to do as we come before the Lord, is just open our hearts to him. Just come to him where you are. Hang on a second, brothers. Um, I'll give you the word in just a second. I want us to come to God right where we are. Listen to this. God has shown us the greatest revelation of who he is in Christ. He has shown us the greatest revelation of who he is in, in Christ, on the cross, the reason why we come and take communion is so that we can look again at how God has revealed himself to us in the cross. Scripture says that in the cross, we see that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. We see his love that was poured out for us. We see that love that's never going to be taken away from us. We see that he loved us not because of anything that we've done, not because of anything we could ever do for him. In fact, it says, well, we were yet sinners. Well, we were at our very worst. Well, you were sinning at your very worst against God. He died for you. He went to the cross. God wants us to see, even as he wanted the disciples to see from the loaves and the bread, he wanted them to look at what Jesus had done and understand who God is. He wants us as we come to him, he wants us to look at the cross and understand who he is. Understand who he is for you. Understand who he is for you right now in the midst of trials that you're going through. And I want you to see this and know this. God, God wants you to see him. He wants to make himself known to you. Whatever it is you're going through, in the midst of it, God wants to make himself known to you. Ask him. Ask him to show up. Ask him to help, help you to see him. So how does this happen? How do, how do, we, how do we see God? How do we overcome our hard-heartedness? You know, even after Jesus died and, and rose from the dead, some of the disciples had seen him and some hadn't and the ones who hadn't seen him didn't believe and one of them said i'm not going to believe until i can stick my finger in his in his hand and my my hand in his side and you know what even when he said that uh, that was called hardness of heart too jesus called that hardness of heart and he rebuked them for their slowness to believe but even still jesus came to him and said look Look at my hands. Look at my side. Go ahead and put your hand in. I want you to be able to see and believe. He's going to do what it takes to help us to be able to see him so we can trust in him. Whatever hardness of heart there is in you, God's able to overcome it. He wants you to see him. He's willing to show up. He's willing to over, overcome your weaknesses. He's willing to be persistent. And so I want to encourage you, as we're, we're passing the elements out in, a, in just a second, I'm going to ask you to do, do three things. Think about three things before the Lord. Isaiah is going to be singing, this is time for you to, to meet with the Lord and process with him. The first is this. If you've seen hardness of heart in your life, just repent of it. Just come to the Lord and say, Lord, my heart's been hard in these areas. I don't know what to do about it. I don't help me with it. Just confess it to him. Second, ask God to show up 
Ask God to help, help you to see him and trust him. And the third thing I want, I want to encourage you is commit to abiding in him. You know what the disciples did right? I, I talked about how patient the Lord was with them. What they did right is they stuck with Jesus. They stayed. They kept showing up. Keep showing up. Keep getting into the word. Keep coming to church. Keep fellowshipping with believers. Keep abiding. Keep showing up. So three things. Confess your any areas of hard-heartedness. Ask God to help you to know him more, to see him. And third, commit to abiding in him. Spend some time with Jesus. I'm going to pray for us, and then the brothers are going to pass these elements out. These are for those of you who have made Jesus your Lord and Savior. Um, taking communion together, you can feel free to say no thank you um, as these are passed around. And I, these, um, the brothers have gloves on. These are like COVID safe kind of little communion things. They have a, they have a cracker on top and then a little juice um, underneath. You'll see when you get it. Let me pray for us. Father, we thank you for your presence here. And Lord, we ask, Father, that you would, you would continue, Lord, to show up in our lives. I pray for each one of my brothers and sisters, for myself. Lord, in the trials that we're going through, help us to, help us to see you, Lord. Help us to know you more. Help us to draw close to you. Help us to be able to trust you. I ask in Jesus' name, amen. these pieces broken and scattered in mercy gathered mended and whole empty handed but not forsaken I've been set free I've been set free amazing grace how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Oh, I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Oh, I can see enough. Oh, I can see the love in your eyes Laying yourself down Raising up the broken to life Take our failures, you take our weakness you set your treasure in jars of clay So take this heart, Lord, I'll be your vessel The world to see your life in me Amazing grace, how sweet the sound That saved a wretch like me Oh, I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. 
Can see the love in your eyes, laying yourself down, raising up the broken to life. Let's um let's stand up together. This is it was really special in that it's this is the first time we've taken communion together in a in a live service in quite some time. And um and communion something we <coughs> we we tried to do our best with the virtual communion and we're we're still doing it for those that can't join us, but but there's a part of communion is really is being able to be together as a body, and this is very special to to have this time together. Let's take take the bread, and if you um, you just peel back just the clear part, and you'll see a little bit of bread there. We'll hold that in our hands. I think what was what was powerful as I was reflecting on this story is that Jesus wants God wants to show us show us his glory. Um, he wants us to see the full extent of his his love for us, his fatherhood. You know, when when trials come up in our lives, he wants us to know. He wants us to he wants us to to, to know his we lose a job and and we don't have anything and we might feel like um god why have you done this to me why have you abandoned me god wants us to see in an even deeper way how he's a father to us he wants to reveal himself in an even deeper way to us and as we take this it represents how much god god wanted to show himself to us i was um I was in tears for a minute as we were worshiping in the beginning. We were singing that song, um, What a Beautiful Name. And the beginning of it says, You were the word at the beginning, one with God, the Lord Most High. Your hidden glory in creation, now revealed in you are Christ. Jesus coming, the image of the invisible God, was to show us so we could understand, so that we could see in flesh and blood form the glory of God, what he's like. And man, I, I want God, I, I, I want the commentary about me to be, he saw, he, he understood about the cross and the tomb. He understood. And God wants us to understand. He wants to show us. We might not understand everything. When, when Jesus when um, Jesus was talking about this to his disciples in John 6, he said, this, this bread is my flesh, and, and this, this cup is my blood, and unless you drink it and, and eat it, you have no part with me. And they didn't understand what he was talking about. We might not understand everything, but we've got to be like Peter and keep coming back because God's going to keep showing himself to us. And Peter said, where else can I go? You have the words of eternal life. And so as we come and we take this, we recognize that this is, the, this is the body of Jesus which is broken for us, where he showed us his love. And so Paul said, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks he broke it and said, This is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Now you can try to pull the seal on your cup back. It's 
hard to do without it breaking, apparently. Okay. There we go. All right. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let's join me as we close in prayer. Father, I thank you so much for, for your presence here. I thank you for your desire, Lord, to show yourself to us. And Lord, I, I ask for your grace, Lord, that we would be people that understand, Lord, your cross and your resurrection. We know what it means, Lord, um, for who you are in our lives, for your presence in our lives, and what it means, Lord, to, to know your fatherhood and your um, abiding presence with us as we walk through whatever trial it is, Lord, that you, you might put in front of us. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you all. Those of you at home, you'll get some, um, you'll have some questions that'll appear.